Hi everyone, welcome to this initial training on experimental methods for active mother. My name is Carlo Manzo. I'm working as an associate professor at the University of Vic, Central University of Catalonia in Vic, close to Barcelona here in Spain. In this class, I'm gonna talk about the characterization of anomalous diffusion and ergodicity breaking from single trajectories. The class has been prepared in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Dr. Gorka munoz -Kil. Gorka is a postdoctoral researcher in the group led by Professor Maciek Levenstein at ICO. Before introducing anomalous diffusion, I would like first to introduce diffusion itself. Diffusion is a very popular process in physics, but as we will see, not only in physics. If we think about the origin of the word diffusion, it comes from Latin and it means to spread out. And actually the first experiment that comes to mind when we think about diffusion is the one of a drop of a substance, for example, ink, diffusing around, meaning spreading out in, a, in another fluid, like for example, water. And over time, these two substances uh, intermixed and we see a change of concentration of the one uh, into, into the other. But besides this example that tells us about the phenomenological uh, view about diffusion, we have examples of diffusion in several other fields of uh, science. It's a very ubiquitous process, a ubiquitous phenomenon. And we studied it in, for example, in solid state physics, in chemistry, but also in uh, geology and geography, in ecology to look at the diffusion, for example, of animals or of cells within animals. It is important to understand the phenomenon of urban growth, and it's also studied in sociology, economics, and finance. So it's a really ubiquitous process that involves several scales, both from the spatial and temporal point of view. We will discuss two mathematical descriptions of the of diffusion. The first one that we will call phenomenological approach is based on a description of uh, uh, diffusion as changes of concentration of a substance. And it can be, the mathematical description can be easily obtained by first combining the first fixed law and the continuity equation into what is uh, called the second fixed law. That basically describes the spatial temporal evolution of a concentration of, of substance. And we can easily see that the general solution of this equation has a Gaussian form, in which the concentration depends as a Gaussian in space and, uh, and time. So these depict the, the first description, which as I said before, is what we would call phenomenological approach, but there's also another approach that we will describe. But for doing that, we will have to step a bit back and start with the work of Robert Brown, a botanist, that in 1827, was looking using a very basic, very simple microscope at pollen grains suspended in water. And he reported his, his observation in, a, in an article. And basically what he observed is that this uh, particle containing pollen grains were uh, jiggling around while suspended in, uh, in the solution. Now, at the beginning he thought that these particles were somehow alive but then he performed a series of uh, very thorough experiments to exclude this hypothesis, as well as ruling out the possibility that there were convection currents causing the motion of these, uh, of these grains. And finally, he described these uh, molecules, these particles as active molecules, which is uh, nice to see that it's strictly connect connected to the, to the title of, uh, of this school. To formalize the, and to understand the causes of this uh, motion, which is usually referred to as Brownian motion from the mathematical point of view, we have to wait some time until Albert Einstein put together a theory. And the theory of Einstein was based on the fact that this uh, pollen grain, as well as other small particles suspended in a fluid uh, were subjected to the action of the molecule of the fluid itself. So what we 
who not really seeing which are the molecule of this fluid are causing the motion of this the larger particle, the, one, the ones that we could see using the microscope and put them in motion. This theory is strictly related to the kinetic theory of gases. And basically what, put, uh, what sets in motion the molecules of the liquid is the, their kinetic energy. And by moving around, they continuously hit the, the particle that's suspended. And since this process is random, causes alteration of the pressure on different sides and uh, move the suspended particle first in one direction then to another, causing this uh, fluctuation that were first observed by Brown and others. Um, Einstein was able to describe the probability distribution for the position of a particle at a given time that turned out to be uh, the Gaussian. So the same solution that we observed, the same mathematical form of the solution that we already saw for the diffusion equation. And actually it's important to notice that although this experiment and this theory that we describe nowadays seems quite uh, simple. It was one of the steps that uh, led to uh, an indirect proof of the existence of atoms and molecules. For this reason, this is generally called the atomistic approach. Besides the formulation performed by Einstein, Smoluchowski also achieved a, a similar explanation using an alternative theory. If we go back to the formulation performed by Einstein, we must say that he considered three assumptions. The first assumption basically considered the fact that the particles are independent in the sense that they do not have interactions. And this is associated to the fact that if we consider a, a concentration that is low enough, this holds. Moreover, a further assumption considers that there is a time scale that we can, uh, can choose. And uh, on these time scales, the displacement performed by a particle at consecutive time steps uh, of the same duration are statistically independent and uncorrelated. The third assumption of the theory of Einstein consider the fact that distribution of displacement performed the interval of the same duration that is uh, the same as the time scale that we defined earlier as a finite variance. The two approaches that we described so far, as we have seen, uh, one deals with a description of diffusion as uh, changes of concentration of the substance, and the other one goes more on the particle or atoms or molecules uh, point of view. However, there is uh, still another description that is uh, associated to the equation of Langevin that also consider Brownian motion from a particle point of view. In this case, one has to consider the overdamped Langevin equation, which is basically the one that is obtained considering that the mass of particle is negligible and there are no forces. In this case, one can describe the velocity as an effect of random forces or of a, um, of a noise that basically takes into account the fact that the interaction between the particle and the surrounding generate these uh, changes in velocity in all the direction in a random fashion. Integrating the, um, this equation, the Langevin equation, leads also to an important result that is particularly important when one has to, wants to perform simulation of Brownian motion. And this basically is um, related to the fact that the displacement on a time uh, scale that in this case we call TLAC uh, have a, a random Gaussian distribution. So basically in this case, we see that if we want to generate a random um, trajectory of a particle, we just have to generate a random distribution for the displacement and then sum them up. Summarizing the three approaches that we have described so far, we can find, of course, something in common since they describe the same phenomenon. The phenological approach, basically, as we said already a few times, describes diffusion in terms of a concentration of a substance. And basically, we have seen that the solution of the fixed second uh, law is a Gaussian distribution. And this Gaussian distribution as a variance that depends on time. And this variance is associated to the spread of the concentration of substance in the, in the medium. 
The atomistic approach consider uh, particles, but it's still a description at the level of an ensemble of particles. In this case, we can see that if we take the probability distribution of finding uh, particles uh, at a given time in space, the, the variance is still uh, linear dependent in time. In this case, this variance has the meaning of the mean area explored by this um, bunch of molecules starting from the same point, for example, the origin at a given time after some time. And then if we consider the, the last approach that we used to describe Brownian motion, which is the one based on the Langevin equation, we see that this one is not based on a substance, on amount of substance or on an ensemble of particles, but it's based on a single particle. And in this case, we see that if we now take the average of the square displacement performed by a particle, by a, a same trajectory in a given time, this also uh, scales linearly, in this case, not with time, but with this uh, finite, uh, interval, finite interval that we call time lag. So in the three cases, we see um, different approaches that lead to the same result. That basically is the way in which um, particles or substances performing diffusion or Brownian motion explore the space. In all the cases, the area, the exploration area of these particles uh, scales linearly in time. And this leads us to definition of an important quantity of an important estimator for diffusion in general, which is the mean square displacement. To try to understand a bit better this quantity, let's bring it to somehow real life and link it to experiments. The output of several experiments are consist of uh, trajectories, meaning time series of an observable. Now I will make an example about single particle tracking, which is a technique in which fluorescent particles, like in this case, uh, molecules of a cell membrane, are fluorescently labeled and image uh, through a video microscopy. As we can see, these particles move around due to Brownian motion or let's say generally speaking diffusion. And besides collecting these movies, we can use softwares to track their position over time. So in this case, the observable is position and obtain these uh, trajectories. Now, just a, a few definitions associated with these uh, trajectories. In general, in an experiment, we collect several trajectories, let's say hundreds. We will use in the following slides the label uh, J to indicate the trajectory number. This trajectory starts a uh, time, we will call it time zero, but this is, uh, this is not, not, does not have any physical meaning. It's just uh, the moment that we start tracking a specific molecule. And each position along the um, along time of this uh, of this trajectory will be indicated through this coordinate, uh, which are represented by the vector x, which belongs to trajectory j. And in general, those those, those positions are sampled at the regular times that depends on the camera frame rate that we will indicate as a k, an integer number, and a time interval delta t. To operate on this trajectory, we can calculate, for example, displacement, meaning the difference between the position between two different times. That since the trajectories are sampled at regular, uh, at, at fixed intervals, will be also multiple of these intervals. And we will uh, call here the tau sub i, like the initial time at which we start collecting this uh, displacement, and uh, tau sub i plus an integer number of times the time interval delta t the other position. And by taking the difference between these two, we obtain the displacement. The displacement are a crucial quantity to calculate the mean square displacement, as the, the word says. And we can calculate two uh, different averages. The first one is called the ensemble average, as you can uh, understand from the name, is based on the fact that we are averaging together uh, quant uh, the, the square displacement belonging to different trajectories. Basically, what we do in this case, we measure the displacement at every given time at which we have sampled our trajectories with respect to the origin, with respect to the time zero. We square it and we obtain it at as a function of the time for, uh, 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 for all the trajectories. Basically, these correspond to um, 
getting a number of trajectories, putting all of them uh, with a common starting point, and then let them evolve and see how much uh, area they explore over time. But an alternative measurement that is in this case is not based on a, a bunch of trajectories, but on a single one is the time average of the uh, square mean displacement but uh, on, and the time average. And what we do in this case is consider only one trajectory. And similar as, um, as the plot that I showed before, uh, basically we uh, take displacement by changing the initial time and fixing the time lag. In this case, the time lag is equal to m times the time interval uh, for, the, for the sampling rate. And uh, what varies, what we run the averages on is the, um, the label i that labels the initial time of uh, by which we take the displacement. This basically corresponds to uh, chopping the, our trajectory in pieces start that have the same duration, yeah. but start at different initial times. And uh, this can be uh, put in an analogy with what we, with the calculation that we that we've done for the ensemble average. Because basically, if we take now these pieces of the trajectory that have a fixed uh, the time duration and we let them uh, coincide uh, in, the, in the center, the origin of our system reference, then calculating the, mean square, the, the time average mean square displacement at the given time lag corresponds to measure the average area explored by this piece of trajectory. And of course, by repeating this operation for different time lags, so for different multiples of uh, the time interval delta t, we get the, uh, the, the, the full curve of the mean square displacement. And in this time, and in this case, does not depend on the time, but on the time lag. Let's go back to the theoretical prediction that we uh, seen before. So if we take into account the Einstein theory, we see that uh, there are two main messages about the mean square displacement. The first one is that no matter if we consider the time average mean square displacement or the ensemble average mean square displacement, their scaling uh, respect to time or time lag is the same. So they have a similar behavior. Taking an average over time for a single trajectory gives a similar result as taking the averages of many trajectories over time. So the system is ergodic. Moreover, this scaling with respect to time or time lag is linear. It means that the mean square displacement grows as a straight line as the time increases. But um, several experiments, there are several experimental evidences that show that this is not the case in some physical systems, physical, biological, but also systems belonging to, uh, to different fields. And what happens is that this, the scaling observed for either the average ensemble, uh, the ensemble average or the time average mean square displacement grows as a power law with an exponent alpha. And this produces a first uh, classification between Brownian diffusion, with the Brownian motion having an exponent alpha equal to one with the linear scaling that we mentioned before, and whatever else has a scaling with an alpha different than one. And that is defined as anomalous diffusion, indeed. Moreover, depending on the value uh, of alpha, we can make uh, a different classification. For example, uh, values of alpha larger than one are called super diffusive, and uh, motion corresponding to values of alpha smaller than one are called sub diffusive. And Within these uh, big classes, we can further uh, pick some uh, particular cases, like for example, the case alpha equal to two, which corresponds to directed or ballistic motion, in the case in which the mean square displacement approaches to a constant value that corresponds to confined motion. So these, uh, in this plot, we are representing the mean square displacement. I mean, we use the mean square displacement when we do not specifically refer to either the time average or the ensemble average, both in the linear scale here on the left or in the log-log scale on the, on the right, just to see how this behavior of this power law looks like in different cases. When anomalous diffusion takes place, there is uh, another um, phenomenon that sometimes can also appear. 
which is related to the fact that in contrast to what we have seen for Brownian motion, where the scaling of the ensemble average and the time average is the same, uh, we can have a different scale. For example, we can have anomalous diffusion occurring in one of the two cases, like in the example I'm showing, the ensemble average and square displacement. But if we take time ensemble uh, mean square displacement, one for each of the trajectories that we uh, have analyzed, we can see that this scaling is still linear. So in this case, besides anomalous diffusion on the ensemble average mean square displacement, we also observe some uh, breaking of the ergodicity. And in this case, um, it's a, spe a specific case, uh, a specific type of ergodicity breaking, which is called weak ergodicity breaking. The reason why it is uh, called weak ergodicity breaking is associated to the fact that if we look at the, the mean square displacement uh, obtained as temporal averages for different trajectories, they have a large scatter of amplitudes, even in a very long trajectory time, a limit. So if we, even if we have very long trajectories, this uh, time average mean square displacement still uh, stays a random variable. And the, na the name weak ergodicity breaking was uh, first associated to physical glasses by, by Bouchon uh, to um, evidence that the behavior of the systems is different from the typical strong ergodicity breaking that we all know about. Because in the strong ergodicity breaking, what we have is a phase space that is separated into domains. And these domains are mutually inaccessible meaning that the particle stays in its phase space and cannot cross the boundary of this uh, domain to visit others. But in the case that is often associated with uh, uh, trajectories and in particular with the experiment of single particle tracking in biological system, but not only in biological system, as we have just said also in physical glasses, we have a similar phenomenon. The um, phase space, is not separated into these uh, inaccessible domains. These domains are interconnected. So the system the, can achieve the exploration of the full space, but this happens at infinite time. So in this case, it is a um, ergodicity breaking from a single particle point of view, from a single trajectory point of view. 